Hello and welcome to the Film Pulse Podcast. This is episode number 429. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today we've got Kevin Rakeshaw. Hey, Kevin. Hey. How's it going? Uh, you know, it's going okay. I got a bit of a neck issue. Woke, oh, up, no. woke up with an extremely stiff neck. Could barely even move. Mm-hmm. Couldn't get out of bed. But uh, it's a little bit better now. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I got myself a, a mug of hot chocolate. Ooh, nice. It's hot chocolate season. It, now, is this like homemade? Is it Swiss Miss? What are you working with here? Uh, Swiss Miss. Nice. Now, yeah. with with or without the marshmallows? Marshmallows. Gotta. Gotta do it. Uh, this week on the show, we'll be reviewing The Power of the Dog, which is out on Netflix right now. We'll also be going over some of watching on the watch list. And going over this week's new releases in theaters, VOD, and Blu-ray. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Please remember to review us on iTunes if you get a moment. That would be super helpful. But by the time you're listening to this, uh, the November episode of Saved by the 90s should be out. So I was super late. I got I had a crazy couple of weeks with the holidays and everything, and I was in New York for a while. So the, the edit got way behind... But it should be out as you're listening to this. Fingers crossed. I'm going to be working on that edit as soon as we're done here. And then uh, one one other thing that I wanted to mention is that I'm going to be moving the Saved by the 90s feed over onto the main Film Pulse feed. So you'll be able to get both shows just on one feed. So it's not. I'm not going to keep them separate anymore. I'm just going to throw them both together. Oh, okay. It's just going to be easier to manage, you know? It's just easier to manage that way. Yeah. So I think that I'm going to do that starting with uh, probably with the December or the Christmas episode. But for now, the, the November one will still be on its own Saved by the 90s feed. All right, let's go ahead and talk about The Power of the Dog. Uh, this is uh, directed by Jane Champ- uh, Campion. Almost a champion. I always want to say Jane Champion. Because she is a champion. Understandable. It's understandable. Yeah. Synopsis here. Charismatic rancher Phil Burbank inspires fear and awe in those around him. When his brother brings home a new wife and her son, Phil torments them until he finds himself exposed to the possibility of love. And is that... I mean, that is technically correct. But that sets up a whole different movie. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's 100% correct. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I, think, I think most people, when you read that, you have a sort of an expectation or you kind of paint this mental picture. Yeah. They, it, like, it, that, it does happen. It happens, but, but the way it plays out, the way, it's definitely not what you would expect no. from that synopsis. That's for sure. Uh, This is based on a novel by Thomas Savage. Uh, I guess we'll start (laughs) with you, Kevin. What are your initial impressions of uh, The Power of the Doll? Uh, First off, I love the way that you say the title of this movie. (laughs) I don't know. I just, I feel like that's how I need to say it. I don't know why. You know, sometimes you're just compelled to do things. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. I get it. It happens all the time. Uh, I I was a fan of this one. Um, I was really looking forward to this. And it almost in its entirety did not disappoint. I mean, I have some qualms with it, but nothing, nothing uh, big enough to really knock this down in in the the esteem that I hold it in. Um, it was. I know that we kind of discussed off off air through a text message about a certain aspect of this movie. <laughs> that I'm sure we'll talk talk more of that was a little bit for me it was it was slightly difficult to kind of get over but in the scheme of things of like what it represents in the movie it fits perfectly but at the same time it is it's difficult to take seriously when when you see this aspect of this movie mm-hmm. which of of course is uh Benedict Cumberbatch his overall performance. Yeah. It, Mostly his gait. <laughs> definitely his gait, but just, he he's so stilted <clears throat> in this. He's so stiff. I f- he's, he's like a, he's like a mannequin walking around in this movie. He's just, 
I think stiff is just the best way to, to describe it. But also, I, it, it, it's the way... I think it's it makes it... It's, like, punctuated even more by the, the clothes that he's wearing, where he's got, like, the hat on and the... the uh, what, what do you call it? The leg things? What are they, why, why am I yeah, drawing blank? I'm not sure what they're called. Chaps? Are they called chaps? Are they called... Because uh, I think... I, Chaps. Is that what they're called? Chaps. Sturdy coverings for the legs. Yeah, I think they're called yeah. chaps. Yeah. Chaps. Yeah, leather chaps. So he's wearing those with the tassels and just the way that he walks is so goofy. He looks mm-hmm. so goofy, like the way he swings his arms around too. It's very yeah. odd. It's it's like Which, I, I don't know if it's like a character choice or like what's going wait, on with that. And this is this is why I really like this aspect of this movie and we did kind of hone in on this a little bit because yes, it is, it is funny. And especially when they show, when you have those distance shots where he's just kind of like walking in the background, <laughs> yeah. like in a distance and it's just, it is really goofy looking cause he really does like the bow legged thing, you know, and he's got the tassels or it's like the fur line chaps that he's wearing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just it's a whole thing and like i i commented to you it looks like he's a like a like an npc character yeah. like a video game like i was waiting for him to like glitch just like keep walking into a wall it just like get stuck in the corner of like the the staircase or something the, the walking animation still going <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <It's> still going <laughs> uh but i like this choice a because I think what it comes down to is, A, you have Benedict Cumberbatch in this role, which this really isn't a role for, for him. This is not the person that you would think in this type of, well, you know, he's super macho, like yeah. Callahan. He can do everything. He's just, he's castrating bulls with his bare hands, just cutting testicles out. He don't care. He's just, he's efficient. He knows everything. He's like an encyclopedia knowledge man he's a man's man he's a renaissance yeah. man but the more you learn about this character it comes down to what you're seeing is this it's performative you know where like he's trying so hard to come off as that like super manly man guy that even in the distance just in case anyone's watching one of the you know seven other cow hands just in case one of them is watching, he's got to be doing the man walk. Yeah. He's got to be, you know, showing that strength, which, you know, comes into play later on in the film once you, you start to learn more about Phil. Because he has that kind of the same thing that uh, Cody Smith McPhee's character, Peter, has is where, you know, it's kind of offhand mentioned that what he went to like Yale or something and yeah. study the classics. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that people had a, a certain certain uh image of him built up in their minds and yeah i think this is him like overcompensating he's constantly, yeah he's constantly performing this you know super macho masculine thing and, and i think that that's why like later like later on in the movie you find out that he like doesn't bathe and stuff and it's it probably f- it all, is all part of that sort of facade that he puts on this macho yeah. facade but there is there is that aspect of it that I can completely understand. It is a bit funny to watch sometimes, <laughs> especially his voice. Like he's doing this like John Wayne yeah. exaggeration and, you know, it's a bit tough to get used to. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I agree. I thought that his, it was a little, it was just weird. It was, a, it was an odd thing. And I thought Cody Smith McPhee's character was very awkward and uncomfortable as well like just you when you watch him you feel uncomfortable for him like it's a Mm -hmm. character that doesn't feel comfortable in his own skin and like he just always seems on edge and like not not comfortable in in his own uh or or where where he's at and and yeah everything and And i i like that juxtaposition because like through his actions you come to find out relatively quickly that he's very comfortable mm. and he knows exactly what he's doing. Oh yeah. But from the outside, he is not, you know, he's not playing that part. He just, he looks so vulnerable mm-hmm. in every situation that he's in, even if it's just a, like I'm sitting at a desk. 
Yeah, you're like, oh boy. It's like <laughs> at any possible moment, you're like, he could die. Yeah, he could I, die. I, I feel like this kid, this kid can get bullied when he's by himself in his room alone. <laughs> and he's about to yes. get bullied. <laughs> those like this, those paper flowers this, are going to bully him. That desk is going to just start tearing into him. So I like the the juxtaposition of their two characters, and I got to say that I was kind of surprised. I like I knew obviously Cumberbatch was a big part of this movie, but I thought uh, Kirsten Dunst and Jesse Plemons were going to be uh, much larger roles. But I mean, Plemons doesn't really do anything here. No, no, he doesn't really. I mean, really, the the. The Dunst and Flemings characters are really just sort of springboards for Cody Smith McPhee's and Benedict Cumberbatch's characters to sort of play off yeah. of each other and have those two personalities collide. Now that we, they, they did get a, they got a uh, Kirsten Dunst's character got a little bit more depth uh, with the the yeah. whole drinking the alcohol is a mangle. However, I was never quite sure like where that came from because at the onset, it seemed that she was very happy. So I, I don't know like at what point or what triggered that change in her. And I think that's the, that's the biggest qualm that I have with this movie is that I, I feel like you do get enough in the initial interactions between Dunce's character when she moves in and her just kind of being uncomfortable around Cumberbatch. And then his, like, he does that type of bullying that, you know, he sneaks in, he does the stealth bullying, he sneaks in when no one's around, does a little bit of bullying, and then, you know, leaves so that if you're like, oh my god, this guy is fucking terrible, I'd be like, oh, you know, I don't really see it. So, I like, I do get some of that, but I feel like I didn't get enough to where she turns into... Like the the alcoholism just fucking takes over. Like, yeah. and I don't know if it's also a bit of like I'm not exactly sure how much time has passed. I think, but I feel I feel like she just went straight to like hardcore alcoholism <laughs> in like three days. Yeah, I feel like a lot more time passed than what it feels like, but it did seem like it was a very quick transition. It se- it seemed like she, as soon as. Uh, Peter Cody Smith McPhee's character came back from school. That's like pretty much as soon as it took over her life. Yeah. Uh, and but it, it was clear that it was even before that too, because I, I believe that it was shortly after he came back. They showed that scene of her uh, hiding the bottle or p- pulling out the hidden bottle, and that was like right after he came back. So presumably she had already been like sneaking it and and that that indicates a problem yeah already so yeah i don't i don't exactly know what happened there and and there was that other scene where she she is supposed to play the piano for the was it the mayor or was it the it was the mayor right i think or, or was the, it the governor, governor? Yeah. yeah the governor his nibs yeah, and like th- there was so there was that kind of whole situation, but I just never really, I c- I just could never really peg her her sort of emotional state and like where she was coming from and why she was feeling the way she was. Like I just couldn't, I I didn't really understand it. Maybe that's because Jesse Plemons, who by the way, if you're not aware, the two of them are married in real life. Um, yeah. I wasn't sure like what he was doing. You know what I mean? Like maybe, maybe part of it is because he's so absent from what's going on in the narrative that like, I just didn't see what, how his, how he was affecting her mental state and stuff. Yeah. Cause it seemed like they had a, pretty good marriage like he seems like a pretty decent guy yeah so, i think it was just that i think it was just this absence of dealing with the the business side of the ranch yeah she she just wasn't expecting it to be the way it was she wasn't expecting to live that kind of ranch lifestyle i guess maybe and yeah and then also the the ever looming threat of the the brother phil because they're living with they're all living in the same house so yeah which yeah. I mean, I mean, should have seen that coming. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he had to know. 
that his brother was a dick, right? Like, oh, yeah. he definitely I mean, this, knew. He <laughs> but, never but, even called me. He only called him fat, so. Yeah. He never, come on. Like, we know that he's a dick. The audience knows that he's a dick within, like, the first scene of the movie, so. Yeah, I think it's just that his presence. Because, you know, you got that, that over-exaggerated walk that he's doing. So you're hearing them boots all the time. Probably in those swishing, swishing chaps. And him just, you know, walking Creep, around. Just creeping up on you with his banjo. Well, yeah. yeah, and he's got, you know he's got a dedicated, like, walk line. Oh, yeah, of course. That's timed out. Yeah. He's got that going on, and he, and he doesn't bathe, so there's a smell. You know, he's always there. Except for when he's, like, in the woods rubbing mud all over his body and being a weirdo. Yeah, that's his, that's his, his alone cove. <laughs> that's where he gets to be himself. That and when he makes his... Cent- centrally weaving his ropes, doing yes. some sensual rope weaving. That is correct. A lot of a lot of uh, innuendo in this movie. A lot of imagery that uh, definitely yeah. insinuates a lot of things. Yes, and that's him, you know, exposing himself to the possibilities of love. Mm-hmm. Yes, which he's he's closed off long ago. But now but he's something, like, okay. something reignites in him and he thinks this i'm gonna do it i'm gonna put myself out there and uh it does not work out for him no but i do kind of uh i do kind of like what happens just because it's like of course you know it's uh it's the west it's montana in the in the 1920s of course that's what would happen because like everything everything gets you back then (laughs) Yeah, I just, I, I like that he had Peter all wrong. Yeah, I did just, like, I did like that kind of, uh, cause you know, there were things, there were, there were sort of clues about Peter <laughs> early on. You're just like, eh, mm, I don't know if it's, you know, what, what, what he's saying here. If it's, if that's a really good excuse for what he's doing, but then like when that thing happens at the end, and obviously I'm speaking very, try, or at least trying to speak cryptically as to not give anything away, what happens at the end, it, in one breath, you're like, oh, that's, okay, that's kind of interesting, but it also, you're like, well, it's not surprising either. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really see that coming, how it, how it turned out, but, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a little bit surprising. Like, I knew that something along those lines was going to happen, but uh, not not the way that it specifically played out. You know, that mm-hmm. still kind of caught me off guard. I was like, wow, he guy, I mean, there was, he said some things that should have given you a heads <laughs> yeah. up there. Yeah, he said some things. He's done some things. He's He was quote unquote practicing or whatever. <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. Like, you know, but that, that was, that's the thing is that, you know, he's not doing the performative masculine thing. So it's just like, you know, I kind of laugh it off. Like, yeah, really? You're strong. Give me a break. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, overall, I think it was, uh, it was interesting. I, I, um, I don't think I was, I was as into it as you were, uh, at first I'd say for the first third or f- first two thirds, I was just like not really on board with it at all um, because I really wasn't into ben- uh, Cumberbatch's whole shtick. Uh, Dunst, I think, is a really great actor, but I often don't like the roles that she's in. Same with Cody Smith McPhee was not into his his character. I thought he was just uh, I, I don't know how like he was he was fine, I guess, but. I don't know. I didn't. I thought that his portrayal was a little bit odd too. And this also has Thomas and McKenzie in it, which I, when I talked about last night in Soho, I discussed my not disdain for her roles, but not a big fan of her style. Yeah. So I wasn't yeah, sure. really, I was really not too on board with this. I, I was sort of falling down the middle. I do. It did definitely redeem itself a bit for me at the end. Once sort of truths came out and revelations were had, and then what happens at the end, it it definitely kind of brought me back in during that. Yeah. 
I did come back, back around, but I, for me, I think that it just to get there was just a little bit too, it was a little too dry for me. Uh, but I can, I can, know. I can understand that. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I think I was into it a little bit more through the first, you know, two thirds. I think this, this movie really starts to kick off when there's that, you know, this is kind of broken up into segments where it's kind of, you know, you're isolating people. And then with the, you know, with the relationships and interactions, and there's a, a, a part around that, like last third, where it goes into Cumberbatch and Smith McPhee spending more time together. And I think that's when this, this film really starts to kick off. Yeah, it's it really interesting. I agree. I agree. Like that's, that's definitely when I started to get more interested in what, was transpiring because i could see it was like i I saw it going one of two ways and either way i was like okay well i'm very curious to see how this how this plays Uh, out yeah because i think that first two thirds is kind of you know you're painting this elaborate facade of this man and once their relationship starts kicking off and they start spending more time together that that veneer kind of starts to slowly come like peel away and you're like, okay, well, this is this is far more interesting. Mm-hmm. So you you need that build up, you know, you need that investment up front. But again, I can totally see if you're not fully on board with that. But I think the thing that kept me in is uh, the look of this film. I mean, the landscape of this. Yeah, I mean, it's good. Like, like I, I definitely will agree that i mean cinematography location all of that is solid but at the same time i feel like it's one of those movies where you could shoot anything in that in that locale and it's gonna look pretty gorgeous you know yeah yeah i didn't think that there was anything overly artistically arresting with the actual cinematography itself or anything but it was fine overall i was a fan I enjoy this. Yeah, overall, it was just solid, solid cinematic storytelling. Yeah, overall, I was a, I, I was sort of slightly above average for me. Uh, all, right. all right, let's go ahead and give it a score. What are you gonna give? The Power of the Dog. What's the? I'm giving a score to what? The Power of the Dog. Thank you. Uh man, I might be going like seven and a half. I, I kind of want to lean towards eight, but I, I'm just not feeling it. I'm not feeling it in my gut, you know? Mm. So I think I'm going to stick with a seven and a half. All right. It's a six for me. Pretty, huh. pretty solid. Let's move on and talk about some of what we've been watching. I'm not sure whose turn it is. I think it might be you. Let's just say you. Okay. I didn't watch a whole lot else. Same. I'm trying to catch up on some some short films here that have been released on movie so all these will be movie and there's another thing that i found out about movie which we discussed before but just a heads up do you remember i think it was slam dance uh taipei suicide story do you yes. remember that like, yes of course yes. loved it that that is on movie i don't know when they released that on there but i just happened to be looking through their shorts and i saw that that was on there so that was a movie that we both thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah. 45 minutes. That's so a good. good. So if you, yeah, if you have a movie, check that out. Highly recommend that one. Um, what I did see is uh, Four Roads by Alice Warwalker, uh, the Italian director. This is like a short documentary. It's a, this is a, a COVID lockdown film. Mm. Uh, so this is about eight minutes. Uh, this is her using a old 16 millimeter camera and she has some expired film. So she just decides to, you know, this is during lockdown. So she decides to just take this camera. If it works out great, if it doesn't fine. And she just goes down the road in each direction to her neighbors and just like films her neighbors and, some lovely music. Of course, you get the lovely 16 millimeter footage. Uh, it's out in the countryside. Great houses, great dogs. Everyone has dogs, and they're great. And it's just, it's a nice eight minutes. Nice. But 
it's also, you know, it's a little fleeting, but, mm. you know, it's a nice eight minutes. Yeah. Uh, all right. I saw The Summit of the Gods. This is uh, directed by Patrick Imbert. This is a uh, animated film that's on Netflix. Netflix animated film. Okay. This is a, it's a French film and it's about a, a photojournalist who see he, he ends up seeing this really famous climber who sort of disappeared. He, he sort of went missing, fell off, fell off the radar, fell off the map. And not only does he see this, this climber, this reclusive climber, but he notices that this climber has a particular camera in his hand. And this camera was held by a man who attempted to climb Mount Everest. And they weren't sure if he made it to the peak or not because he went missing. But if, if he did make it to the peak, then he would have been the first person to ever make it to the, to the top. So what this photojournalist does is he goes, he sets out to find this, this climber and see if a, he did find the missing guy and recover the camera and B where he found him, because presumably if he found him, then that means that this guy's climbing Everest and that means that he's going to be like sort of coming out of retirement and looking to, you know, hit, go up there and hit the peak. So it's uh it's quite good. The animation is really good. i really liked the animation quite a bit. This is based on a manga that came out. Uh, I don't know. I think maybe in the nineties, but I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really good. There's some really exciting moments to it for whatever reason. I always lo- I always kind of like rock climbing movies. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I guess this they're just exciting they're just thrilling and this one is is that I mean it's heartbreaking at times there's some really sort of tragic moments in it but overall uh it's it's quite good so I would I would recommend it and again it's on Netflix the summit of the gods summit of the gods uh another one on movie is still processing this is from uh Sophie Rambari this is a, like a 17 minute long doc. Yeah, I'm familiar with this one. Have it's, you seen this? I haven't seen it because okay. it looked a little bit too heavy for like uh, where yeah. I was at in my mind. Yeah. So I'm here I'm here to tell you that that is 100% true. Yeah, I, it so looks incredible. Make, sh- make sure your mind is in the right place. And I don't know if it ever would be. Yeah. With this essentially what she does here is she's been trying to make this movie for like three three years she says in the beginning and what it is she gets this like this box this this box of photographs videos uh unprocessed photographs uh, you know just a huge box from her parents and with a, a note that comes along with it um she lost her two older brothers and this is like all the stuff from their childhood apparently like their their father just always had a camera with them which is always taking pictures and stuff so she's never seen what's in the context of these box and she goes through it for the first time while on camera so it's just her you know and it's just you know the emotions that come up with that and everything and uh, it's it's quite uh, it's quite moving, and like as you said, if you're not even if you are in the right headspace for this, it still hits you like a ton of bricks. Yeah. And uh, but with that in mind, uh, I definitely suggest checking it out. It is really really good, uh, and it it will it will give you it'll punch you in the gut a couple of times over. And it's just so simple, yeah. which I think is, is something that with her films that I'm always struck by is just how simple everything is. Yeah. I, the, I like the emotional impact that it, it, it provides. Yeah. I think that she's, uh, she's such a good filmmaker. I think that she's just 
Absolutely. Her career is just going to explode any moment. Yeah. Uh, one that this is, this is the last one that I saw this week. Uh, and it's one that I f- was surprised that also features a couple gut punches. And that's the worst person in the world from, uh, Joaquin Trier, probably mispronouncing his first I, name, actually. I did not know that he did Like, I've heard the title of this film numerous times. I didn't know he was the director of it. Yeah, so this is the guy who did um, Oslo, August 31st, and he did uh, Thelma, and he did Reprise. Now, looking at... Uh, so I didn't see Reprise. I did see uh, Oslo, August 31st. Apparently, this... This movie, The Worst Person in the World, is sort of the end cap to the, a trilogy of films uh, that start with Reprise and then go to Oslo, August 31st, and then end, end in this one. It's sort of like, mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're not connected in any way other than, like, thematically. But... This is uh it was this was a kind of a surprise for me because I was thinking that it was going to be a comedy. I didn't know too much about it, but I I it sounded like it was going to be sort of a dark comedy involving this this young it, it follows 4 years in the life of this woman as she sort of just navigates life. And it seemed like it was going to be a comedy, but it is definitely not a comedy. There are funny moments to be sure, but uh overall it's uh it's pretty depressing in a lot of ways. Uh, I will say that she's not the worst person in the world. Uh, she's actually a quite likable character, but it's told in 12 different chapters and there is a prologue and an epilogue. So they split things up into neat and tidy little slices, which I actually liked quite a bit. There is this sort of narrator that, that, goes through the story so it, it's told almost like uh you know like a book like a, a a memoir or something about about this woman and that didn't necessarily work for me but the movie overall i thought was was quite good i thought that uh renata uh reins reins uh the, the the lead i thought that she was quite good in this i don't know that i've ever seen that she was in oslo august 31st but to be honest i don't remember a lot about that movie yeah i remember bits and pieces i don't remember her yeah i don't remember her in it uh either way she's quite good and uh yeah it's i would recommend it it's 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 definitely worth a look uh the last short that i have is a 20 minute short world premiere on a movie and that's the newest one from matthew porterfield mm. this is quattro paredes this is uh him shooting in mexico and uh i don't re- recommend it. Mm. it it's it's just not anything that i want in a movie <laughs> <laughs> not to be harsh but it's just it's Okay, so Barbara Lopez, she's the only character. She plays someone named Carla. She goes to Mexico. She's staying at her aunt's house uh, like a year after her father's death. And uh, in this time, she just she's essentially just talking to herself. There's really two scenes here in the 20 minutes. is her listening to a voicemail on her phone from a friend of hers that's just like essentially reciting a poem. And that's it. And then the second part is just uh, Barbara Lopez talking into the camera, which is just like her, like just speaking out loud to herself, essentially. And it's supposed to, I guess his aim here is how language uh, has the power to like be cinematic or, you know, come to life and fill the edges of the screen as as movie says here but it's just a person talking to, mm. with a static camera yeah and that is the, like it's, this is not the right art form in my mind like why 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 would i ever want that as a movie i don't want that it just doesn't work for me at all 
Oh, that's unfortunate. All right, let's take a look at what we have in theaters this week. Uh, the big one is West Side Story. This is the Steven Spielberg remake reboot thing. Mm-hmm. I take it you have no interest in this. None same. whatsoever. Yeah, same, same. We also have National Champions coming out in theaters. I'm not sure what that is, but that's opening. I yeah, don't know anything about it, actually. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's see. On VOD this week, on the 7th of December, we have Are You Happy Now? We have The Reenactment, Fatal Distraction. You know, get it? It's like not Fatal Attraction, Fatal Distraction, mm-hmm. which uh, okay. actually this That's looks, it. this does look pretty interesting. It's a documentary about the a murder trial of Justin Ross Harris, who... Uh, in 2014 left his son in the car and the, and the, the son tragically passed away because of the heat Mm. and the, the movies about the, like the fact that he forgot the child and like, you know, looking at whether or not it was on purpose or he actually did forget or whatever, like, you know, so, well, that looks kind of interesting. And I think it also dives into the, the, the sort of the concept of just getting distracted and like forgetting your kids. <laughs> so yeah, oh. I don't know. I might check that out five time. We have the scrapper coming out. Uh, let's see. We have the handler, the end of us. That's the Saban Films one. On the ninth, we have Death Valley. That's going to be on Shutter. That is the new one by uh, the guy, the the the, the dude who did um, Psycho Gorman. So mm. I would expect some interesting creature design in there. I started watching this uh, and it was not great, so I just I had to turn it off because I just was not in the right mindset for something like that. Mm. On the 10th, we have Encounter. That's going to be on Amazon Prime. That's the sci-fi one with uh, Riz Ahmed. We got The Hating Game. Uh, Agnes is coming out. That one's worth a look. That's the, the uh, which is, what's his name? Mickey, Mickey Reese. Mickey Reese. Reese. Yeah, Mickey Reese one. Sort of a possession film, but it's definitely not your traditional possession film. Does some interesting things. We got Hurt coming out, Off the Rails, The Unforgivable, that's going to be on Netflix, that's the one with Sandra Bullock, where she plays a a murderer, convicted murderer, who gets out of prison, and the difficulties that she faces after she gets out of prison. Uh, Let's see, American Sicario is also coming out, and I believe that is it for VOD. On Blu-ray this week, we have Krampus coming out in 4K. That's the 2015 one. You know, I never did see that. I heard it was good, but I didn't. Maybe, I, maybe I'll try to catch up with it this year. There you go. New, new Christmas tradition. Yeah, maybe. Oh, uh, Who Framed K. Roger Rabbit is coming out in 4K. Oh. There's a Steelbook version of that coming out, too. Uh, Beavis and Butthead Do America is getting a new Blu-ray release. Hard Target coming out in 4K. There's a Karate Kid collection. That's going to be in 4K. Let's see. The Long Goodbye from 1973. Angels with Dirty Faces from 1938. Mill of the Stone Women from 1960. Coming out on Arrow. Uh, Werewolves Within. That was the horror comedy that came out, I think, earlier this year. That was pretty good. Looks like Street Fighter from 1994 is getting some sort of new blu-ray release oh man (laughs) uh a lot of nostalgia with that one for me cry machos coming out that's the clint eastwood one from earlier this year cop shop get crazy from 1983 bronze gone wrong from earlier this year that's the animated one earlier this year that was like two weeks yeah yeah actually (laughs) it was very recent 
Final Justice from 1985 is coming out on the MVD Rewind collection. Uh, Checkered Flag or Crash from 1977. Checkered Flag or Crash. Oh boy, Dear Evan Hansen coming out. Look out. Oh boy. Arrow is releasing a Giallo Essentials box set. This is only three movies. However, all three of them are very good. Uh, they include What Have You Done to You? What Have They Done to Your Daughters? Torso and Strip Nude for Your Killer. All three I can easily recommend. I think Torso might be the best of those three. However, uh, one, one thing to note is that these are just like sort of packaged re-releases of what Arrow previously put out. So they, they already released all three of these and now they're just doing it in like a cool little box. Okay, gotcha. Uh, let's see. Insect, a.k.a. Blue Monkey from 1987. Um, that's pretty much it. What about Criterions? We got one Criterion. That's a contemporary pick from 2020. And that is Regina King's One Night in Miami. Nice. With a bunch of special features on there. Yeah, I liked that movie. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure about the Criterion aspect, but... No, me either. But, I mean, you got a lot of special features on here that look pretty damn good. So if you liked that movie and you wanted to pick up the Blu-ray, here you go. I guess the Regina King I guess the Regina King aspect of it as far as like the Oscars, like that sort of makes it a, a notable title, but yeah, I don't know. It's it was a good movie nonetheless. Like I'm not yeah, besmirching yeah. the movie itself. I noticed that Harold and Maud is coming out. It, it's not a I didn't mention it because it's I thought that that was on Criterion, but this is not a Criterion release. It's a Paramount Presents release. Ooh. Wasn't Harold and Maude on Criterion at some point? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think it was. But this is like a, some other edition that's coming out. It's got a cool cover. I liked Harold and Maude. What a, what a strange movie that was. I don't know. Never finished it. <laughs> I think we talked about that on the show. I think so. I think so. Uh, at any rate, I think that's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. You can send us your questions and topics to podcast at filmpulse.net. You can follow us on Twitter at filmpulse.net and at filmpulsekevin. And if you have a minute, consider reviewing us on iTunes. That would be extremely helpful. For Kevin Rakestraw, my name is Adam Patterson. We'll see you next week. Yeah.